Amen. So we're going to be continuing uh, through John chapter 10. We're going to finish out the chapter, and there's a little bit of a, a confusing statement that Jesus gives at the end of John chapter 10 that I want to explore in detail this, this evening and show you um, what Jesus is trying to say there. But look down at your, your Bible in John chapter 10. We're going to start out in verse number 25 tonight. So we've already looked at the parable of the sheep, and we've already looked at how, you know, the sheep... They, they hear the voice, and they won't forget the voice. We looked at how that's an analogy, not an analogy, but that's a parable, um, explaining how once you know Jesus, once you believed on Jesus, you're not going to stop believing. You're not going to forget that. You just know the Holy Spirit is going to keep you um, in that knowledge. We looked at that um, last week, but look down at verse number 25. Now that we have that knowledge, and let's continue here. Um, this is quite a complex chapter, actually, when you look at what Jesus is talking about to the Jews here. Um, everything kind of builds upon um, the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and it really shows you the depth of God and the depth of you know, God's word here. Look at verse 25. It says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. So the problem is he's talking to these Jews, and they are not believing who he is. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. He said, even because of the miracles, you don't do the, you know, you're not believing me. He healed the blind man. They even admitted that no one had seen any kind of miracle like that before in the history of the world, yet they still didn't believe him. But you believe not, verse 26, because you're not of my sheep. Then again, referring to um, the parable that he gave at the beginning of the chapter, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And then in verse 28 and verse number 29, but mainly verse 28 and 29, Jesus gives this, this, uh, these two, this phrase basically that is probably in the Bible the biggest um, proof of eternal security. I mean, eternal security is all over the Bible, but the, the most clear one, at least to me, um, when I was exploring eternal security, when I was you know, trying to figure out what was true, in the Bible, when I was listening to the gospel and looking at the Bible, John 10, 28 is really hard to get away from in the Bible if you're trying to disprove eternal security. Look at verse number 28. Jesus says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So, first of all, who is them that he's talking about? He's talking about the people that he has been describing in the parable earlier the sheep that know his voice. He's saying somebody that hears the voice of Jesus that believes him, and that, you know, not the opposite of what he's talking about, believe not, up in verse 25. These are people that believe Jesus, and he's saying, believed on Jesus, and he's saying, I give unto them eternal life. He says three different ways here. I mean, he literally says an all-encompassing statement three times. He says, I give unto them eternal life. Look, that's enough right there. Why does he keep saying something? I mean, if I give you eternal life, do I need to say anything else? Do I need to describe that you're not going to you know, end up in hell, that you're not going to you know, get the second death? He says, I give unto them eternal life, but then he says it a second time, and they shall never perish. So he covers the other side of it too, meaning they will never spiritually be thrown into, they're never going to go to hell. They're never going to get the second death of revelation. And then he says it a third time, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So he says, I give them eternal life, they will never be damned, and no man can ever change that. He says it three different times. What do you do with that if you think you can lose your salvation? How do you, I mean, how do you, this is, this was what I was up against. Eternal security was my one hang-up as a Lutheran. I give unto them eternal life. First of all, the, just the fact that it's called eternal life right there, we're done. Eternal life, everlasting life. How many times do you have to get that? You say that at the door all the time to people. If you get eternal life today, how, how many more times do you need to get eternal life? I mean, an eight-year-old will tell you one time because it's eternal. And they shall never perish. I mean, again, never Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, including yourself. You're a man. You know, including, you know, any person, any, even including the person themselves. So three times he says it, and then in verse number 29, he puts this cap on it. He says, my father, which gave them me, is greater than all. So now he's saying there's even someone more powerful than me, 
and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So then he seals it with the Father, with the guarantee of the Father. I mean, it's just eternal security through and through. And it's, it's a great proof of eternal security in those two verses. The thing about eternal security and the doctrine of it, and I'm not going to preach any more on it um, after um, these two verses right here, but the thing about eternal security you need to understand, and maybe you haven't seen this if you like, never were in a place for years where you didn't believe eternal security, but if you don't believe in eternal security, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get th give you this Bible methodology tonight, Bible reading and interpreting methodology. If you don't believe in eternal security, if you don't accept this doctrine, many, many, many parts of the Bible will not make sense to you. The only way where the entire Bible comes together and everything fits and makes sense is if you believe eternal security. And that's not an accident. That's on purpose. All right, and I'm going to give you that um, Bible reading tip and Bible interpreting tip just a little bit later. I kind of gave it away there. Anyway, turn to John, or look at John chapter 10 and verse number 30. Then Jesus says this. He says, I and my Father are one. So much for Jesus never claiming to be God. He says, I and my Father are one. So he says, I give unto them eternal life. They will never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And my Father who is greater than me. And then he says, I and my Father are one. So, look, Jesus is, what he means here is that Jesus is God. He's claiming the same divinity as God the Father. They are both God. All right, look, Jesus is subservient to the Father, but they are both 100% God. You say, it's, it's basically what we're looking at here in verse number 30 is two persons of the same God. That's what you're looking at. And look, it, separate wills, always obedient though. You say separate wills and people freak out. They're like, what? No, it's, look, you saw when Jesus was in the garden is, and he asked God, you know, you know remove this. If it, if it be, you know, your will, remove this cup from me. And then, you know, it wasn't God's will that that cup be removed from him. So he went through and he just asked. What you saw was the humanity of Christ. You saw the pain and the stress and the suffering. And I believe that that was necessary for us to see that if it was in the Bible. But always subservient. Same God. You're like, I don't understand that. Well, ask Jesus when you get to heaven how it works. I mean, you know, we don't have to get all, you know, crazy about it. People, like, just they drive themselves insane trying to understand something that we probably just can't completely understand as human beings. All right, look down at John chapter 10 and verse number 31. So he claims to be equal with the Father. You say equal in what sense? I thought he's subservient to the Father. Equal in the sense that they are both God. Jesus is not a lesser God. He is, he is as much God as God the Father. Same God, three persons. All right? Look at verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Again, I mean, it's very, I mean, Jesus was killed for this. This is why he was crucified. Of course, he was crucified for the sins of the world. I get that. But from the legal perspective, the Jews were after him because he was claiming to be one with God. And because thou, that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. It didn't say makest thyself a God. He was making himself God. He was making himself equal with God the Father. Jesus answered them, and this is really what I want to get at tonight. The next two verses. It says, Jesus answered them and says, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, of whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? You're like, what in the world? What's he talking about? Turn to Psalm chapter 82. And this is what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at what Jesus is talking about. If you open your Bible up right in the middle, you'll be in the book of Psalms and look at Psalm chapter 82. This is what Jesus is quoting here to the Pharisees. And I want to show you why, God, why Jesus is quoting this specific quote to the Pharisees. 
In verse 34, I'm going to read it for you again. You're turning to Psalm 82. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? Referring to the law, he's talking about the Bible. He's talking about the word of God. I mean, this is what Jesus is constantly telling the Pharisees. It's just like, don't you know the Bible? Have ye not read? Have ye not read? Have ye not read? How many times has Jesus already, just in the book of John, like, uh, just said, like, if you would have believed the Bible, you would have believed on me. You don't believe the Bible, and that's why you don't believe me. Because Jesus is literally the Word of God. All right? Look at Psalm chapter 82. This is what Jesus is quoting when he says, Ye are God. So he says to the Jews, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders here who are trying to kill him, he says, Ye. So what is he talking to? He's talking about, he's talking to the whole group of them. Ye being plural. He's saying, ye are gods. But look at Psalm 82. You're like, that's weird. The Bible says this. It says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. So in verse number one, the Bible here says that God judges amongst or among the gods. Lowercase G. Look at verse number three. So then he's saying, he's like, you're, they're, they're judging whoever these gods are. They're judging unjustly. They're accepting wicked people. They said, instead, he says in verse number three and verse number four, he gives this command in these next two verses to these lowercase gods. He says, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. Now, he gave commands to these gods. Then in verse 5, he says, They know not, neither will they understand. Talking about the gods again. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. So there we are. We already get kind of a clue there where these gods are. They're in the earth. I have said, and this is what Jesus was talking about, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Turn to Psalm chapter 95. So Jesus is, or Jesus, the, the Bible, God, is kind of lecturing these gods, whatever these gods are, all right? We already kind of saw a clue that they were people that were in the earth somewhere. Look at Psalm chapter 95 and verse number 1. The Bible says in Psalm 95, 1, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. That's, of course, Jesus. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. So notice how in verse number 3 it talks about the kingship of Christ. So we see that Christ, I mean, one of the roles of Jesus, yes, he's God, yes, he's the savior of the world, but he's the king of what? He's the king of kings. So when Jesus rules in the millennial reign, he's going to rule with a rod of iron, but yes, there's going to be many people ruling and reigning with him, but he is the king of kings. So he is the king above all gods. So what I'm trying to get you to see tonight, turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. When you see the lowercase God word in the Old Testament, you must take context into account. You can't just say, look at, you know, G-O-D, lowercase G-O-D in the Bible and say, oh, that means, you know, false gods and idols. Because it has different meanings in the Bible. And even, I, I hate to even say this, but even going back to the Hebrew word of uh, Elohim, I think it's E-L-O-H-I-M, it's used many different places talking about different things. But you must take into account the context that it's used in. It's used for God Almighty, and it's also used for what I'm going to explain to you this evening. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2. So here's what we know it can't be referring to. Because the Bible says that like false gods, idols that people worship, these are things, these are just wood, stone. These are dumb idols. They, they don't exist. They're not things that are real. So people that, you know, that worship some, you know, sun god or whatever, you know, you could say, okay, that's a demon or whatever, but that, that god doesn't exist. It's not real. Okay, it's just a piece of rock 
It's a piece of wood. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Here's God's, God is talking about a nation that has left God to go worship gods that aren't gods. They're not, they're not real. They're not, they're not there. They're just, they're just idols. They're just rock. They're just marble. They're just whatever. It's fake is what he's saying. All right? So that can't be what Psalm 82 is talking about because those gods are not real. God is specifically talking to something, someone that is real in Psalm chapter 82. Now go back. Um, actually, go to 1 Samuel chapter 28. And let me give you another example that kind of points us in the direction of you know, what Psalm 82 is talking about. So the answer to the word gods in the Bible, lowercase gods in the Bible, is that context must be taken into account when you see that word. You can't just see that word and just assume that it means something. You must look at the context that it's used in. All right, look at 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse number 13. 1 Samuel 28, verse number 13. This is kind of a big clue right here. It says, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? This is King Saul when he goes to the, the witch and when he hears from Samuel. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. She has this vision. And she sees these gods ascending out of the earth. What are they? They fake gods? And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up and is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped his face to the ground and bowed himself. So here we see that the gods, in this case, were men. It was men of authority. So the general term where context matters in Psalm chapter 82, go back to Psalm chapter 82. Psalm chapter 82 is God talking to rulers. He is talking to men that have authority. In verse number one, it becomes clear now. It says, God, this is the Lord God Almighty, standeth in the congregation of the mighty. Uh, look, this is, he's standing in the congregation of, of, of these powerful people. But God is the, uh, the mightiest, of course. He judgeth among the gods. So, if there, there are no other gods, in, you know, talking about divinities out there. All right, we know that. So look at verse number two. It says, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. So here he's looking at people. He's, he's looking at these gods, these, these rulers. And he's saying, why are you accepting these wicked people? Why are you allowing these wicked people to do what? He, he, to, to afflict the poor and fatherless. To afflict the poor and the needy, he says in the next two verses. But He's saying instead, do justice. He's lecturing these gods. He's lecturing these rulers. He's lecturing these rulers saying, do justice to the poor and the needy, the poor and the fatherless, and save them from the wicked. Now let me ask you this. Where are the wicked and where are the poor and needy and the fatherless? They're on the earth. He is talking to rulers on the earth that should be following the word of God. That is who he, was, he is talking about. Look at verse number five. Now he goes back and he's just like, they know not. Why don't they know, by the way? They know not because they're not listening to the word of God. And Jesus is going to explain that in John chapter 10. In just a, a minute, I'll show you that. He says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Look, again, you have to kind of have your Bible reading and not your modern English ears on here. It says, neither will they understand, meaning they don't have a will to understand. Meaning they, they don't want to understand. What is the problem that Jesus is having with the Jews right now? What is the problem that Jesus is having with the Pharisees? It seems like they don't want to understand. It seems like they don't want to listen to the Word of God. It seems like they don't care what kind of miracles that they see. No matter what they see, no matter what they hear, they do not have a will to understand. You start to see why Jesus quoted Psalm chapter 82? I have said, verse 6, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. What does that mean? Turn to John chapter 1, 
and verse number 12. Turn to John chapter 1 and verse number 12. So you see, in the first six verses of Psalm 82, God is lecturing these rulers. He is saying, you should be doing just things, and you are not. You are giving over poor, helpless people to wicked people. By the way, what do we see rulers doing today? Same thing. John chapter 1, verse 12. All of you are children of the Most High. That's what the Bible, that's what God says in verse number 6. You are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. In verse number 12 of John 1, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Sons of God. So anyone who believes on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ becomes a son. Turn to Galatians. Um, actually, go to John 3.16. Go two chapters over. So the saved become sons of God. Lowercase s. You're like, I don't, I don't know. Are we going to be Mormons here pretty soon? We become sons of God. That's true. We become daughters of God. But look at John 3.16, the most famous verse in the whole Bible. It's got this super important word in it that maybe we skip over too much. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Amen. that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, yes, when someone believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they become a son of God or a daughter of God. In what way? Turn to Galatians chapter 4. But there is only one begotten Son of God. Amen. There is only one. Be what does begotten mean? Begotten means born of, of, a, of a woman. There is only one person who was, look, you weren't born uh, saved. You weren't born uh, automatically adopted by God. Yeah, you were born and you didn't, uh, you know, until you, you were aware of your sin, you weren't condemned, but you were not born adopted into God's family. You were not born a son of God. There's only one, adopt, one begotten son of God. There's only one begotten son of God that is equal with God, that is just as much God as God the Father. It's talking about just like through procreation, God the Father through Mary, Jesus. There's only one. We are spiritual sons of God. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. I know this isn't like, you know, Bible 101 here, but, you know, it's, it's important to understand because it's always these complicated things that Jesus says that are used to, like, teach crazy things. All right, look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 3. The Bible says, Even so we, when we were children... We're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, that's that only begotten son, made of a woman. See, that's the begotten part right there. Made under the law. It was God the Father with Mary. That was how Jesus was begotten. Joseph was not Jesus' father. And because ye are what? Oh, I'm sorry. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the what? This is how we become the sons of God that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are an adopted son. You're an adopted part of this family, not physical, not begotten. Turn back to Psalm chapter 82. Turn back to Psalm chapter 82. So you are not a begotten son of God. You are a spiritually adopted son of God. And guess what? According to Psalm chapter 82, you should be, you know, those children of God. That's what, that's what God wants these rulers to be. God wants these rulers to not be these people that just accept wicked people. He wants these people to accept. He wants them to be adopted children of his. That's what God is saying in Psalm chapter 82. They should be following the word of God. They should be listening to the word of God. And guess what? They should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what Psalm chapter 82 is talking about. All right, now look. Here's what it doesn't mean. Here's what it doesn't mean. After I've showed you all that throughout the Bible, and we could go to 
verse after verse and chapter after chapter about you being adopted into God's family and how we have this spiritual adoption and Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. We could go to just verse after verse after verse, and I could go and I could show you dozens of verses where gods talk about idols in the Old Testament, and where gods talk about, and gods talking about, um, you know, rulers that are men in this case. All right? But here's what it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that we are going to become equal with God and get our own planet one day. But that's what will be taught out of verses like this. Here's, here's the Bible tip tonight. Here's the Bible reading and Bible interpreting tip on, like this is not super easy stuff right here to, 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 to grasp. You know, you have to cross-reference things and look at context. But the Bible tip is this. All doctrine should be based on clear scriptures. That's, that's the first tip. And the second tip is this. When you look at a Bible interpretation and it doesn't match, like you look at Psalm chapter 82 and it doesn't match other clear scriptures in the Bible, the problem is you, not the Bible. That is the second tip. So the first one is base all your doctrine on clear scriptures. And the second one is whenever you're reading something and you interpret it in a way where it just completely throws off, you know, other clear scriptures, like you interpreted it wrong. You know, where, oh, does that mean that we don't have eternal security? Well, clearly not. If it breaks John 10, 28 and 29, you made the mistake, not the Bible, right? Because there is a way to interpret the Bible, folks where it all matches perfectly. And that's what you are looking for. You can't, you can't interpret the Bible to where this one breaks this one. You're doing something wrong. The problem's not the Bible. The problem is you. And look, if you get, if you get weird with Psalm chapter 82, if you get weird with just the word gods in the Bible, you can go, I mean, there's some crazy stuff. You can go down some weird rabbit holes right there. I mean, you talk about, if you talk about, you can even get weird with sons of God. I'm going to get weird with sons of God and say, oh, that's not saved people. That's not children of God. Even though it's clearly talking about children of God the same way in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm just like, I don't know. Where's the disconnect here? But what if we just call it angels in one verse? And now we can talk about giants and Nephilim and, and we can get all weird and we go to Job and we can be like, oh, you know, the, like in Genesis they had these babies and they were 800 feet tall and, and all this and, and God had destroyed the world. I'm like, what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. Like when you start saying, and then, and then like all these false doctrines, this is like false doctrine methodology is what they do. They take obscure scriptures and they create a whole story or even a whole religion out of it. I mean, Mormonism uses Psalm 82 heavy. Heavy. Because, I mean, that's like, you can be a god just like Jesus. I'm like, okay, we have problems with like everywhere else in the Bible then. He accidentally turned us into Satan. Oops! Because it was Satan that said, I can be like the Most High. Instead, we'll create a religion out of it, out of one, you know, word that's used in multiple different ways in, according to the context it's, it's used in, all right? And look, it doesn't even make any sense because when you look at, you know, the sons of God thing, like the sons of God, I mean, first of all, just because it says that we become adopted into God's family, we become sons of God, like that we would become equal with God, like how do you make that, how do you make that jump right there? Yes, it's true that as a son of God, we are going to have eternal life. It is true that as a son of God, and I mean, somebody might have even made this comment in the church, like when I was preaching about the millennial reign, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the millennial reign, in our glorified bodies. People are probably going to look at us and be like, there's something different about that guy. Yeah, probably, but that doesn't mean we're God. That doesn't mean we become divinity. Right? We are given eternal life as a gift. It's not like we're suddenly given this ability to become God and God says, now you go rule your own planet, you know, and now we, we go into the YouTube cartoon where I could just create a religion out of that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It, the whole Bible needs to make sense when you, when you jump to a conclusion of something, all right? Now, what did Jesus mean? You could probably already see 
what Jesus means here, but he basically referenced Psalm chapter, turn to Romans chapter 13. He basically referenced Psalm chapter 82 where God is lecturing these leaders. God is saying, you should be sons of God. You should be following the word of God. You should not be following the wicked. You should not be oppressed, you know, letting these wicked people. Look, I think that he wants these leaders to be saved, don't you? He's saying, don't allow. I mean, he's literally talking to people who should be saved. I mean, wouldn't it be ideal if every ruler and leader that we had was saved and followed the word of God? I mean, it, you, you may be like, your head explodes even just thinking about that. And it's never going to happen until Jesus comes back and rules and reigns with a rod of iron, because that's what it's going to take. But the point is, that's what God wants. God is telling us. This is how to do it. This is how to rule properly. In Psalm chapter 82, he applies this to the Pharisees. And he's like, look at the contrast between what you're supposed to be and what you are. God's already lectured people on this. And he just points them to the lecture that God gave these rulers. Look at Romans chapter 13. And look, now that we've interpreted God's as rulers that God is lecturing in Psalm chapter 82, let's see if it matches other parts of the Bible. Where God is lecturing rulers to follow his word, do the right thing, which what? It protects the poor, it protects the weak, it protects the needy, it protects the fatherless. It protects people that have no protection. He's saying your job as a leader is to protect people that can't protect themselves and have, have no one else to protect them. That's your job as a ruler. Look at Romans 13. Romans 13, verse number one, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, but the powers that be are ordained of God. This, Romans 13, you have to read it like this is what God wants rulers to be. You have to read it this way. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, it's saying follow these rulers that are, that are doing what Psalm 82 wants them to do. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Four, so you say, I'm supposed to follow every single ruler no matter what they do, ever? Look at the next verse. It says, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. This is saying, these are the kinds of gods, lowercase g, that God wants to be ruling, that God ordains to be ruling. He's saying, the ones that are terror, they're not a terror to good works, but they're a terror to the evil. What is he explaining in Psalm 82? Quit being good to the wicked people. It's exactly the same thing. Romans 13 is exactly, I mean, Romans 13, 3, you should just have a, a, a line in your Bible that says Psalm 82. Because it's exactly the same advice. It says, Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So, God is assuming a good ruler in verse number one through three. He's saying, this is a ruler. God is kind of lecturing you. He's kind of lecturing you in this case, saying, look, rulers are put there to be a terror to the evil and to be good to, you know, the, they're not a terror to good works, but they're a terror to the evil. They're, they're there to, like, stop the wicked people. That's what the rulers are there for, and you should listen to them. Now, some people will be like, you need to listen to rulers no matter what. I mean, it's like... What? No. And then he says, then he says in verse 4, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. This is the, it's, it's assuming a ruler is doing Psalm 82 here, what God wants him to do. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God. This is talking about a ruler who is doing what God has ordained him to do in Romans 13. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You say, what about a ruler that's bad? Well, I mean, verse number one, let every subject be subject unto the higher powers. The highest power is always God. So this is assuming, this is assuming you have God and then you have this, this man-made authority. It could be, the chain could be five authorities long and then you're down at the end and they're all following what God wants. They're all being a terror to the evil. And God is saying you should listen to that ordained authority. But, that, I mean, but obviously, if like the ordained authority is like, hey, go kill all these people, then you're like, well, no, because like, God doesn't want me to murder people. It's easy. Okay? It's, it's easy to understand. All right? 
Unfortunately, every ruler is not like this. As a matter of fact, I can't think of one. <laughs> However, Jesus is standing in front of the Pharisees here when he references Psalm 82 and what God thinks of what? What God thinks of rulers. What God expects of leaders. He's saying, you should be gods. You should be listening. You should be receiving God's word. You should be children of God. He's saying, you should believe me. He's saying, you should believe me. You're the leaders. He's literally telling them that, you know, he's saying, you should be the sons of God through adoption. And then you're accusing me? And you're, you're coming at me? It's like, you're not even doing what you're supposed to do as, an, or, you know, as a leader in this community, in this nation, whatever you're doing. And then you're going you're gonna to look at me, who's the only begotten son of God, and accuse me? He's like, look at yourself. Psalm 82. He is saying that all leaders are accountable to God, and they are failing at what they're doing. Look, and guess what, folks? Look at Romans chapter 14. I mean, what, what, a, what a complicated and brilliant way to lecture somebody on a Bible that they clearly don't know or believe when he points them to Psalm chapter 82. But he's saying that as leaders, you will be held accountable because you are not following the Word of God, which, by the way, happens to be standing right in front of you. But guess what? I mean, what's the application for us? I mean, the application for us is, is a pretty simple one. The application for us is a pretty simple one, is that, you know, I mean, I know the Bible says, you know, everybody, you know, everybody knows this one, and we go to this one a lot, but the Bible says that, that, leader, that pastors will be held accountable, that pastors will be accountable for what happens, you know, in, in the church. It says in Hebrews 13 that, that the pastor of, of the church, which is Jesus Christ, he's the, he's the under-shepherd. He's the one that is, you know, just maintaining the church until, you know, the good shepherd, you know, Jesus comes back. But the Bible says that, you know, he must give account on what happened. And, you know, a pastor should, the Bible says, should, should be able to give account with joy. A pastor shouldn't go in front of Jesus you know, when, when, he's, when he's standing in front of Jesus and Jesus asks him to give account on how he ran his church on the earth and a pastor shouldn't hang his head and be like, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I know that I didn't do what you wanted me to do. No, a pastor, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, should be able to, to give that account with joy. So that means that a pastor that, that you know, and that, that's, that's probably not going to go well in a lot of different areas on the earth, but at least... I'll be able to stand in front of Jesus with joy at that moment and say, you know what, I, I, I did the best I could. I, I followed your word. I, I did things the way you said that they should be done. And then I can be joyful about that account. But guess what? In Romans 14, look at verse number 12. It says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Uh-oh. The Bible is saying, look, let me tell you something. Psalm 82 applies to anybody that has influence in their life because that's what leadership is, is influence. You're like, well, I'm not a leader. Look, parents are going to give account. Parents are going to give account to Jesus Christ for what they did on this earth. You say, well, I'm not a parent. I don't have any kids yet. I'm just young and I'm single and whatever. I'm not a leader of anything. You know what? You have influence over whoever you're around. And you'll give account for that influence. This is the saved person. This is the person that gets saved at the door and then goes out and just lives their life with a bunch of unsaved people. You will give account for that. You will give account for that lack of influence that you should have, have showed. Instead, you were being influenced by people that were not saved, people that were not, what, children of God. Every single person will give account to Jesus in their life. What they did. Parents, husbands, wives... You will give account, mothers, you will give account on how you led your home, on how you led your children. You will give account on, you know, the lack of, 
you know, teaching the Word of God to your children. You will give account to all the things that you missed. You will give account because you are someone that is influencing. You are someone that is put in place to protect. You are someone that is put in place to help the poor and the needy and the fatherless. And you are someone that if you have any kind of influence in your life, maybe you just have a group of friends, you'll give account to how you influence those friends. This is Psalm 82, and this is what Jesus was explaining to the Pharisee. And look, the more influence you have, the more account you will give. He's talking about the kings of the earth, the powerful men of the earth, and they will give the worst, the, the, the most account. This is why Jesus was so furious with the Pharisees. I mean, if you actually read the words of Jesus, he is screaming and furious with them. He's calling them names left and right. He's calling them vipers and children of Belial. And I mean, he's just, he's like, he's basically telling them they're sons of Satan. I mean, he's just yelling at them constantly. He's furious because they are leaders and they are damaging. They, they should be out there helping the poor and the needy and the fatherless. Instead, they're leading all those people in a wicked direction. They are the wicked people that Psalm 82 is talking about. The Bible here is telling, I mean, Jesus here, he, he is saying, like, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You're being the wicked of Psalm 82. And guess what? People suffer for it. That's why Jesus was so mad at these people all the time. He said somebody needs to deliver. And I mean, if you really want to read into it, Jesus was saying that someone needs to deliver all these people, all these poor, needy, fatherless people from you, is what he's saying to the Pharisees. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.